All right, everyone. Well, welcome to Don't Be Caught Off Guard. I am super excited about today's webinar. I have a very special guest. I'm Dori Sukup, and with me today is Ed Kuhn, and we are going to be discussing the latest and the trendiest things that are happening with insurance companies, things that you definitely need to know and be aware of that can affect your business. So I've known Ed for several years now. Oh my gosh, I can't even know how long. It's been a while. <laughs> and um, when he started uh, telling me about all these changes, I was like, Ed, you've got to come and help our community and make sure everybody's aware of all the things that are going on. So he's taking time out of his busy day to be with us today so he can share with you all his expertise and knowledge that um, he comes across every single day and make sure that you guys are aware of it. We do have some people here that are brand new with us. In case you don't know who I am, I'm the founder of Inspiration Management. I get to travel around the world and speak and help uh, busy professionals and entrepreneurs like yourself elevate their success. And I have to tell you, we're about to publish my latest book. It's probably going to be out in about a month. It's called How to Make Millions with Your Medical Spa. It's going to be my latest one. It's going to be my third book. So I'm super excited about that. And uh, I'm happy to announce that my son, Charlie, actually just graduated with his biochemistry degree. And he's back from Australia and trying to decide what he wants to do. So <laughs> that age, you never know, right, Ed? <laughs> yeah, for sure, yeah. And so uh, I'm going to let you actually start and telling people a little bit how you got into this field and what you've been doing for the past few years and how you really make a difference in medical spas and medical practices around the country. Okay, thanks. Um, well, Thanks, Dory. I appreciate the time to uh, have us on this afternoon. And uh, really, it's a it's going to be a, a kind of a state of the marketplace type presentation. Um, uh, and as Dory mentioned, we've been working together a long time um, on med spa business sp specifically. And uh, I started um, this specialty agency back in 2001 uh, when doctors came to me and basically said that they were going to be practicing uh, aesthetics and anti-aging medicine, which was kind of outside of the realm of, of standard medicine, and that they needed specialty insurance, and in particular at that time to cover things that perhaps weren't FDA approved, and all the new cutting edge technologies that were coming into the forefront um, with things such as uh, hormone replacement therapy and HCG weight loss, and then all, all the aesthetic type um, procedures that have evolved over the last uh, several years. Um, regarding skin work and things like uh, lipo dissolve, liposuction, uh, peels, and, and uh, all th th these manufacturers have come forth with new uh, procedures that doctors are, are basically doing on elective procedures for their patients and, and getting paid cash. And so we started this uh, uh, interfacing with specialty markets and developing this over time to when we first started out, there weren't a lot of companies doing it. The prices were expensive. We'll kind of get into that later. Mm -hmm. um, and then it, it's kind of evolved now to the point where it's maturing right. uh, for the last 12 or 15 years. And so that, that, that maturing process uh, with the proliferation of more and more healthcare practitioners getting in, more and more procedures being introduced you know, has caused kind of a little bit of a violent storm out there in the insurance industry. And that's what we're going to update you on today. Okay. Well, the thing also, what I'm noticing is a lot of people are coming into this field now and they really are not aware of exactly what type of insurance even they need to have before they even open their doors. For example, as you know, we both speak at the Empire Medical Training and many of those folks are medical professionals that are just getting started. So they really need this uh, information so they know what exactly is going on and how much really it costs to even have this type of insurance that we're gonna be talking about. So you're gonna have two types of audience with us, I think today, some people who are already in business and some people who are just actually getting started. So let's start with um, the kind of protection they actually need first. Well, uh, thanks, Dory. That, that's kind of like uh, our theme is insurance's protection. 
Uh, you buy insurance to protect yourself from unforeseen risk in operating your med spa business. Mm -hmm. um, in particular, um, things like you know medical negligence allegations, uh, and it's a whole different class. The med spa um, is a different medical underwriting class in that uh, anti-aging practitioners uh, get the there, there is a, a certain level of risk involved that's different than um, what I would call standard medicine that involves things like surgery and orthopedics uh, and basically um, working with people that come to the healthcare practitioner because they're, they're sick or they have some kind of pain problem and they just want to get that addressed. This is different. This is people that are coming to you by their, um, their, their own decision, uh, they're paying cash, they're uh, mm -hmm. telling their friends, and they're doing it because they they they're they're not sick, but they want maybe have a certain thing that they want to have worked on in their appearance or the, with, with the way they feel. Right. So, so it does definitely make a difference, like you said. So let's start with what's um, happening right now in the market. Well, I'm trying to get the the, the screen to move here, so I, I, I'm not sure if everyone out there is seeing the screens as they move. Like I'm not. <laughs> We have a couple of things while Ed is doing that. I'd like to tell you about a couple of things we have going on. October is going to be a very busy month for us. We have the book writing seminar. So if you haven't become a published author yet, you should probably come to that. That's on October 5th and 6th. And then we have our mastermind group on October 7th and 8th. And then we have the Leap Ahead Seminar on October 21st, 22nd, and 23rd. So Dory's going to be a busy little cookie, not to mention a couple of other events that we have going on that I'm speaking at. So I want to invite you all to, if you have not been to one of these seminars, to come and join us and let us help you build your business. It's always fun to see people from all over the country come and participate in these great events. Okay, um, I'm ready now. I'm, I'm, yeah, sorry for the for the delay. I'm going to start with the what's happening in the market slide. Okay, that's where we are. Okay, and so the question begs, you know, what is happening out there? Well, the premiums are going up, and the reason why uh, the, the the insurance companies are increasing what they call their minimum premiums, which is the minimum amount of money that they will charge to put up their million dollar limit of liability to cover you for your services. Uh, that's just an indication of what they call the market hardening up in that there's starting to be a proliferation of more claims coming in and the higher expenses associated with underwriting this type of class. Uh, there's increases also at renewal. Basically, the insurance companies want to get more money into their surplus in um, preparation of being able to pay these claims that they anticipate coming in as more and more procedures and more and more practitioners are out there practicing. Mm -hmm. And that leads in, in basically in base rates overall and really property and casualty rates as a whole, um, including everything from liability, but also, uh, you know, catastrophes and, and things like that are on the rise. So that's causing the overall insurance prices uh, to go up. And, in, partic and in, in some procedures in particular, stem cells and P PRP, which I'll get into later. Mm -hmm. They're also mm -hmm. putting uh, more limitations and restrictions uh, on some of the, the policies and uh, uh, as respect some of the procedures that they're doing uh, and they're getting very rigid on underwriting requirements and in, in particular in two areas. Number one is, is solid evidence of certified training in the procedure that needs to be demonstrated before they will even underwrite and uh, give you insurance for this and also mm -hmm. uh, very um, solid patient informed consents that are um, go along with making sure that the patient knows what they're getting into. And when you think about it, when you have those two things, that is the, your defense in a claim because you never want to mm -hmm. be in a position where a plaintiff's attorney will state that you didn't know what you were doing mm -hmm. and the patient didn't know what they were getting into. Right. And right. obviously it's hard to defend a claim in cases where the healthcare practitioner didn't have any formalized training or the patient didn't realize, didn't sign a consent mm -hmm. form realizing what they're getting into. So that kind of goes without saying, but it's to the point now where if you don't have those two things in place before you start treating people, uh, the insurance company will warranty it. And what I mean by that is they'll put on their policies, and this is new, they put on their policies that if you don't have evidence of training for the procedure and you don't have 
a patient informed consent form that's signed by the patient, they'll deny the claim. Mm. That's, that's a big change. That's interesting. Can we, so it's, it's can we start a, from the very beginning though? Let's say I'm opening a brand new place or I may have a place. What kind of insurance do I need, first of all? Is it just the liability insurance or are there other things I need to have? Okay, good question. Uh, the, the core products that you need for a med spa are the medical professional liability for your healthcare practitioners and usually starts with the medical director on down. Mm -hmm. And that will cover you for medical negligence allegations. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's your professional liability. And then the other part of it is your, what I call your premises, your facility, your space liability, which is more of the traditional insurance that everyone's familiar with. Mm -hmm. which is what they call the business owner's policy. And the business mm -hmm. owner's policy is bought by anyone really that owns a business, irregardless of what business you're in. And that's things like a slip and fall, your patients get hurt on your premises, um, damages to, damage to equipment, um, things like checks being stolen out of your office, uh, basically just normal liability that comes into play when you run a business. So if you put those two things together, those are your core products that you need if you're starting a med spa. The professional liability and then the general liability, which is usually required just to sign a lease, uh, in, in, assuming that most people rent their space. Okay. Now, do you also have to have each person on the team have their own liability insurance? No, the way it's structured, Dory, is we cover the business, and the business would be the LLC uh, or the corporation that the med spa was formed under and that the services are been, being delivered under. We find that that's common because, let's say if you're a physician, you're going to probably already have another practice, right? Nice. Uh, and that will be covered by that particular policy. This would be a separate policy. Um, you would form an LLC because of the cash base side of the house. Um, and you do that for legal reasons, you do that for tax reasons, and you also do that for insurance reasons. So we would cover that name of the business, and then you, the, the medical director coverage is automatically built in, and then we, we decide who's doing direct patient care, and then cover the people based on the size and scope of the, the direct patient care. Yeah. Are they full-time? What, what, what about if you have independent contractors that are working with you, then are they responsible to get their own or are they covered under your LLC? They could go both ways. Typically an independent contractor by nature will have their own policy because they want to be able to work for you, but other places as well. Uh, we can get them covered either way. It's just that when they're independent contractors, we have to put a little blurb in the policy stating that the coverage afforded here to this independent contractor is solely for the work being done at this med spa and nowhere else. Okay. All right, great. Thank you for answering those questions. I, I had them actually mailed a little bit earlier. All right, so let's start with how everything got developed as far as the market itself. Okay, but there actually was a quick question uh, from June regarding, real quick, medical directors share the whole coverage or a certain amount of coverage. And real quick, uh, June, the, the medical director coverage is built into the policy. We know that you have to have one in, 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 you know, in order to have a med spa. So the medical director is automatically covered in whatever capacity that they're in. And they just have to be designated at the time of applying for the insurance. Okay, great. We'll keep your questions coming. If you have any questions, you can add them in the Q&A box there. And uh, Ed will be happy to answer them for you, either as we're coming along, going along, or at the end. Thanks. Well, so we've established the fact that the market is changing. The underwriting is more rigid. They're asking for more information, requiring you to have more training and have solid consent forms. And how did, how did we get to that over time? Well, what's happening is, is quite frankly, the industry is growing. The claims are starting to develop. Uh, the underwriters are collecting money and then paying out money and expenses and claims. And that, that's what they refer to as an underwriting profit or an underwriting loss. Mm -hmm. And recently, uh, they've been looking to increase their premiums collected in order to basically shore up for what they anticipate uh, losses coming in in the future. And that has to do with basically the marketplace is starting to mature. Uh, I'll, I mentioned that when we first started out, we had just had a few companies. Uh, they didn't really have specific policy forms related to what you were doing. And we had to make it evolve over time. 
and now we we went from having maybe a handful of companies to well now we have maybe a dozen players in the marketplace uh, each with their own specialties and there has been a rapid expansion of a lot of procedures particularly stem cells for instance okay. where uh, the ramp up has been has been very quick and again they're kind of shoring up the the surplus if you will for the future uh, and a lot of the claims had to do with lack of certified you know, people that were certified in the procedure doing the procedure mm -hmm. and, and that is that has caused to that training to be shored up but also the fact that there's not a really lot of experienced underwriters out there too on my end that really understand and have been around underwriting med spas long enough to know the ups and downs of the mm -hmm. particular marketplace um, which leads to you know quality control issues really on both ends on the, on the end of the of the insurer and the insuree so mm -hmm. both ends are trying to kind of scramble to get caught up there mm -hmm. um, and really it, a lot of it has to do on the claim side with patient expectations as, as okay. one of the things that uh, I mentioned earlier is that when patients are paying you cash for their procedures, their ex expectations are a lot different, mm -hmm. sometimes almost to the point of borderline unreasonable, which is why the informed consents are key to managing what the patient is going to expect out of what you're, out of the treatment they're going to get. Right. And then I finally, think, you know, the yeah. personal injury attorneys are, are catching on to the fact that there's a lot of money flowing into this industry. Yes. They're looking for reasons to, you know, be able to file suit. Um, uh, this is not a, a type of claim where you, you hurt somebody, you damage somebody, but what we're seeing is mainly just, you know, again, you, the patient had ex certain expectations that maybe weren't met. Right. Uh, I've never seen a claim that has been, you know, really serious in terms of medical malpractice damaging to someone um, recently at least. And so most of the claims that are coming in have to do with, you know, managing these patient expectations. That's why those consent forms are so important. And I'm surprised how many people don't really pay attention to what type of consent forms are people signing within the medical spa. As a matter of fact, uh, last month I did an interview like this Ed, with a, a medical spa attorney, Allison Avila. And if you guys have not watched that interview, you really should go. And um, actually Allison had worked on every single consent form you could possibly want. It's all written by her as an attorney. And we actually have it as a product right now. It's called Protect Your Business. And it has, I mean, it has like one consent form after another, protocols, everything that the client needs to sign and everything your team needs to know about the different treatments that you're offering. So that's a big protection. So in addition to the insurance that you'll be getting from Ed, you also need to know what you must do to protect yourself and your team members by having them sign those consent forms and it makes a big difference doesn't it it's critical in, in the defense of a claim because of, yeah. again if you're managing the patient for the most part unlike what i would call sick people medicine where mm -hmm. you know they're um they're they're not doing i wouldn't say they're not doing a bit of the free will but this is elective and, it, and it's a lot it's a lot different than mm -hmm. you know, um, when they're going in to get their gallbladder removed or something along those lines yeah so let's go into the underwriting process. What exactly, like, is this a conversation with you, finding out how many rooms, what kind of treatments I have, and then working something out? How does that exactly work? The underwriting process is basically the qualification process of, of you as the applicant med spa are qualified to get insurance so that the insurance underwriter can qualify for protect you for up to a million dollars in that liability insurance mm -hmm. it's really determined by what you do you the first step they do is, is what do you do what class are you in they put you in a particular class mm -hmm. uh, once you're in that class then they figure out how large you are and, and it's, it's always a function of the size and scope of your practice mm -hmm. are you part-time mm -hmm. uh, are you in one location are you in many locations do you have a lot of people working for you so that the and they use quantifiable measures um, such as uh, the main one we see is revenue size. Mm -hmm. For instance, half a million dollars in revenue below usually doesn't, doesn't mandate a surcharge 
But once you start getting over a million dollars, then they start adding more premium just to uh, compensate for the size. And which is, of course, that equates to the number of patients coming in, more procedures being done, and more patient visits. So that's really the bottom line on that. Mm -hmm. And so they do look at several variables involved. The variables are what comes out in the application process. So as tedious and as redundant sometimes as these applications are, that's basically your representation of who you are, what you do, who works for you. Have you ever been sued? Are you licensed? Mm -hmm. um, what are you doing? How often are you doing it? So those are the key things that, that, that determine the variables that determine you know, what your, your, your cost is going to be. So Again, the, the, to accentuate, it's not so much uh, what you do, but how well you perform. Yeah. Let I mean, me ask sorry, you, though, what would be a range? Budget. Like, let's say I was doing a million dollars in revenue. So what would be the range between, let's say, one million and five million? What kind of liability insurance would I need? Good question. Uh, if you were, it, it, it kind of follows up uh, on a scale, so to speak where you know uh under a million dollars you're probably going to get minimum premium uh i'm sorry under half a million dollars you're going to get the base rate when you go from a half a million to a million you'll probably be charged maybe a 20 percent on top of that and then additional 20 percent for every million or half million on top of that so yes. if you went from a five hundred thousand dollar revenue to five million your okay. premium would essentially be double and in some cases more than that you know, each company has a little bit different, but the, the point to be made is that your scale is going to increase as that quantifiable measure increases as well. And, mm -hmm. and so uh, I think that that is really a part of any type of insurance that's based on size and scope. Mm -hmm. Like the number of widgets, insurance? square foot of your house. And the, in this particular case, they use revenues. Is the insurance divided by like a certain amount for each treatment? Like let's say, okay, I'm doing laser. So, so much of my liability insurance goes to that. I do uh, cool sculpting. So much is going to that. Or is it just a general? So if somebody's suing you for a certain treatment, are they locked into, this is the maximum I'm going to pay for that one treatment? Or can they go into your entire liability insurance? It definitely is tied to the num the type of treatment that you do. Okay. Um, we have, for instance, some um, laser hair removal. That could, if you have some clinics that do thousands of them a year, uh, and of course that involves heat, and uh, that's going to be priced differently than if you're doing hormone replacement therapy, where you might be only doing you know 500 procedures a year. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's your mix of what you do. Uh, and one thing I found in looking at various med spa applications is no two are different mm -hmm. and they kind of run with what they like to do or what they think they their patients like or what the, it falls in the line what their marketing is you know are they a weight loss clinic specialty are they mostly aesthetics are they mostly a uh, you know hormone replacement mm -hmm. uh, or a combination thereof of, of all of everything it's really comes down to the business plan determined on what your help with these clients and what you determine is best for them, you know, okay. to make the millions going in a med spa. <laughs> Sounds good. That was very good. All right. So what should they look for? So you're out there in the marketplace and, and you're, you're going to look, buy some insurance for your med spa. And the first thing you would do is, you know, you got to, you're looking for what type of company. There are most of the companies, that, all the companies that we deal with are what they call A rated by a third party rating uh, company and in, in most popular being a company called AM Best. And a rated just means that they've been, um, they've been in business for more than five years, that they have a solid financial background behind them but to do what? Well, to pay claims. Uh, and, and there's companies out there that are referred to as risk retention groups. That's what I mean here by the acronym RRGs. And a risk retention group is basically a startup insurance company. And as such, they don't have a rating and they typically don't have a large surplus to withstand a run on claims in the event that they would write policies and they would have a lot of claims. Mm -hmm. So you don't really need to go with the risk retention group because there's plenty of A-rated companies out there that are priced competitively. And how, do you, know, how do you know if they're A-rated? Like, do you ask or is it published? Is it 
Yeah, that's a great question. If they'll, your agent will know. Like I, I, I basically will tell my clients that I won't, I won't never present to you anything unless it is an A-rated company. Okay. Or they can, you know, you can always go online and check out the company's financials and uh, download their best report and things if they really wanted to get into it. Yeah. Okay. But a lot of the companies we deal with, Dory, are our household names, you know, AIG, Markel Corporation, Admiral Insurance Company, Medical Protective, which is Berkshire Hathaway. So just a lot of CNA. So a lot of the name, just the name alone will, you know, evoke quality and, and strength financially. Okay. The, uh, the, the next thing is your actual, what you're buying is your actually your policy form. The policy form can be broad or it can be very narrow. Uh, we as agents always want to make sure that it's the most comprehensive, broadest policy form that we can offer you. Um, and of course, at the very minimum, cover all your procedures and is specific has specific wording to the med spa risk involved. Uh, and then you, have, you always look at um, the policy form itself, but also the endorsements. And the endorsements add coverage to the policy, uh, which would be like you're adding a location, you're adding another healthcare practitioner. Mm -hmm. uh, and exclusions, by contrast, are things that typically restrict coverage. For instance, I use the FDA exclusion. A lot of policies have exclusions, for instance, that say we will not pay a claim that involves any procedure, medical device, or product that's not approved by the FDA. Mm -hmm. Well, that's something you need to be aware of if you are doing yeah. procedures that are not FDA approved. For and sure. so you, sure. you would want to get that exclusion removed mm -hmm. or to go with a company that's not going to have it in there in the first place. Right. And but most of the exclusions are general, you know, they exclude things like, you know, breach of contract or um, bodily uh, or property damage, because this isn't a property policy or anything nuclear or anything that has to do with um, employment practices, because what we want to be able to do is make sure that this policy is specific for medical negligence only. And it's not one of these policies that are going to throw in a bunch of liabilities together, because then that could erode your limit in the event that there's a a claim that involves something other than medical professional liability. Mm -hmm. um, so it's got to be the, the coverage and the pricing and the endorsements and exclusions and everything we've talked about here on the what to look for screen should be matched to your level of risk. Mm -hmm. Shouldn't be anything less or really anything more. And, and, and if it is, then you're not going to overpay or underpay. Right. And then finally, once you get the policy, you know, you want to be able to six months into it, say, well, gee, I want to start doing stem cells now, or I want to start doing some aesthetic procedure. And you have to have an under it. It's flexible enough that you can do that during the course of the, of, of the policy period. Yeah. It's kind of like where you, where you were, where you would start. Mm -hmm. So the next thing you were going to talk about is the different levels of risk. So when they look at your menu of offering or when you're assessing how much their liability insurance is going to be, so they're going to look at their menu they're going to kind of guesstimate of how much of your business is going to be Botox and fillers, how much is going to be bioidentical hormones, how much is uh, st stem cells, and then that's what's going to determine the quotation of how much you pay. Yeah, these are the right. These are the, the what the, the the underwriters' level of risk. I mean, everybody's basically covering Botox. You're not going to be writing med spa li liability as Botox being you know kind of like the entry level procedure, right? Mm -hmm. Botox and fillers, massage, peels, uh, acupuncture, things that really are, you know, not that invasive, that, in, that don't have a, history, a lot of claims. And then it just scales up from there where hormone replace, replacement therapy is kind of like in the middle um, along with laser skin. And, and then you get on a high end, which are basically all the cutting edge technologies that are coming that don't have a, a long track record. Mm -hmm. um, stem cells, PRP, vaginal rejuvenation, chelation, uh, anything that has to do with, with fat transfers. Uh, and we can get those things covered. It's just that as you go up this scale from low risk to high risk, the number of insurance companies that offer coverage diminishes. I see. So if you, if you are, are applying for coverage for, let's say, stem cells and PRP, you know that right off the bat, you're going to be in, in a situation where you're not going to have as many choices uh, mm -hmm. from a market standpoint as you would if you're just doing, you know, light level aesthetics. Right. Sounds good. So Which I know you have some when you're going into it. I know you want to get into stem cells a little bit because there are many spas now are starting to actually offer it. And um, um, 
you can actually i have these uh, slides backwards i think yeah um the, the stem cells um I, i'm focusing on that because recent there's been some recent developments on it it's been expanding quickly uh and i've narrowed it down that these eight questions that need to be addressed for the underwriter to be comfortable with any healthcare practitioner to do stem cells mm -hmm. for instance i'm just going to pick one uh you know the number six what patient review process is utilized to confirm the need for a stem cell treatment and this kind of goes in a line that you're selling treatments not procedures you know you, you've done an analysis as a healthcare practitioner and realized that stem cells is the best treatment then you match that up mm -hmm. uh, what specifically are you treating with them and you got to have you have to have more of a plan because what was happening dory is people were getting trained in stem cells not really having a game plan or a business plan of what to use them for but they wanted to have the training to be able to take advantage of opportunities mm -hmm. that could arise you know throughout the course of the, the policy period in this particular case and the bottom line here is when you apply for stem cells there it's got to be as detailed and as forward and as direct as you can in implementing them in order for the underwriters to feel comfortable that they want to you know put their liability and, and uh, put their company's million dollars behind that mm -hmm. What's, what has caused this is there's been some of the suppliers uh, out there that have been shut down by the fda which has caused a ripple effect either the suppliers to the doctors buying from those suppliers to the personal injury attorneys recognizing those doctors and then basically suing them saying well you were prescribing stem cells from a DEA shutdown type facility right. that there's not particularly a problem with that but that just kind of goes into what I was saying that the lawyers will follow the money into it you right. know well there's a problem here then we're we're going to see if, if we can <laughs> you know put yeah. some stuff there let me so see that's how, how I can get in on this action <laughs> right right and so you got to just be very direct very solid in your approach if you if you're going to do stem cell therapy yeah makes sense right so, now currently we only have three companies covering it i mean i wow. know that's hard to believe in in the in the w wide world of insurance but we're only down to three companies and one company is only issuing a hundred thousand dollar limit of liability which really doesn't afford you much coverage yeah wow well that's because, not going to encourage many people to offer well it, it's just a narrow more of a narrow window to qualify than it, it was before is really probably the best way to put that together yeah uh, and once you have a policy and once you're uh, wheeling and dealing with your procedures what can you do to keep your risk low and what you could you, what can you do to avoid claims so if if, if what we've done we talked about what the state of the marketplace how did we get there some of the particulars but now that you have a policy what do you, what can you do now to improve your situation going forward well we talked about the the certified training um if you can't reiterate that enough and the informed consent mm -hmm. but also good documentation uh and what i've seen happen once in a while and the reason why i mention this is because of the expectations involved a lot of times the, the patients are not happy with the results right Mm -hmm. You have to have a policy for that. Um, I call it disgruntled patients or bad outcomes. Uh, do, you, do you give them their money back? Do you um, give them free treatments to offset what they've spent? Mm -hmm. uh, I don't really know what the precise answer is, but you have to have a policy for that because um, that you don't never want to leave someone not happy, and right. especially if they felt like they were hurt in some particular way or it didn't look right to them. Uh, that's probably your best way to kind of avoid and manage your risk is managing your patient basically yeah well i think also, what you're saying, you're managing that managing that expectation which is so important and if they're during the consultation process if they paint the picture and not over promise then that's not going to come back to bite you but if they're sitting there and painting this beautiful picture that's when you start getting in trouble Right. Like I said, you know, no, no outrageous claims or results of guarantees, you know, for things like, you know, weight loss, we guarantee you're going to lose 60 pounds or right. we, we guarantee that, that if you do, your veins will go away or anything like that. It's managing the expectations and 
you know, uh, the results. The results involved um, is the best way to not only avoid a claim, but as I mentioned here, you know, a lot of times you get board complaints. Mm -hmm. They they go they, another they go. Patient isn't happy with you. They go to another healthcare practitioner. That healthcare practitioner then makes a complaint to the state medical board on that patient's behalf. And yeah. we all know, and we're not going to get into that now, but we all know that that's not good. Yeah, that's not good at all. <laughs> and it always came down to the patient wasn't happy for some reason. Mm -hmm. uh, and not everyone's going to get the, the results that they achieve. With, and it, it kind of circles back around again to the informed consent. Mm -hmm. We told you in the informed consent that this could happen. It happened. We'll do the best to manage that at this particular point. But, you know, right. um, that's, why that's, a, that's why that is important. Yeah. So, what does uh, claims made mean? Well, the reason why uh, why I'm going into the it's very important that the policies that are issued in the med spa arena are what they call claims made, and it's very similar to like your auto insurance. You have to have the insurance in force when the claim is made, not when the actual wrongful act occurred. And that ties into medical malpractice and the statute of limitations. If you get in a car accident, you, you get an accident, you report it the next day or the day of the accident, right to the insurance company because you're aware of it. But with medical liability, you're, there's a lot of cases that you're not aware of. And patients have up to two years in most states, three in some, to bring a claim uh, forth. So you need what like a lag period in order to report a claim. It's very important that you realize. It's a long time. Right. You need to be covered for the entire length of the time that you're practicing. And not only that, but when you stop practicing, which is, you know, or sell your, your med spa to another business, let's say, and for some reason that your insurance policy would cancel, then that triggers the extended reporting, which is a, a feature of the claims made policy. It's referred to as tail. And really what it is, is you paying for extra insurance at the end, and it's a sunk cost because you have to come up with that money all at once. So something that you want to accrue for over time, because it's, it's something that you're going to have to get eventually with a claims made policy. And this, this is, you know, insurance 101 for an agent like me in this particular med spa arena, uh, because the claims made policies, uh, one thing I want people to understand is how they work so that they're aware of it when they're out there shopping for coverage, that it's going to be a claims made policy and that there is going to be some extended reporting and how you report the claim is important. Okay. Is, are there any questions relative to that right now? Because um, actually you have people another probably already, already, already you familiar with that. Can you see the question? There's a Caroline. Yeah, I can see the questions okay. coming up, right. Okay, so we haven't answered Caroline, so if you want to answer that one. Let me see. Starting an aesthetic practice under a separate corporation form, not as a hired medical director, mostly on weekends. I'm sorry, could you, could you, I can't see the question here. Oh, it says starting an aesthetic business under a separate corporation formed not as a hired medical director so i guess i don't know whether she's a medical professional or not though yeah i don't understand you know the hiring under a separate corporation um you know there, there's we, we want to always make sure that that you know we if that's what your business plan is um the medical director is there it's got to be obviously connected to the, all the healthcare practitioners that work under that particular corporation oh, she's renting she's going to be renting a room in a day spa and using it mainly on the weekends i guess maybe she's starting a different corporation okay well in that particular you know it, it, that corporation would have a, a medical director no matter who the woman is even if you're renting maybe another practice as medical director that would still be your medical director Mm -hmm. So we have another question here from June. Is it any company offer accurate occurrence coverage? Good question. No, they don't. If they did, we will offer that to them. Because if, uh, if it's really a pay me now, pay me later situation, 
with a currency, you pay for the tail up front. So, so let me give you an example. If you get a claims made quote for $5,000, the occurrence might be seven. And so you pay 7,000 this year, 7,000 next year, maybe 8,000 the next year. And so you're always gonna be paying more than the claims made policy, but basically what you're doing is you're prepaying, prepaying your extended reporting. Mm. Whereas opposed to claims made, you don't have to pay for the tail until it's invoked, which is when you cancel it. And if, I would like to be able to offer my clients both, but the companies don't like that because they don't like that hidden liability in the future. Mm. They like to be able to close the years out one year after another. Right. And so so they can figure out, you know, if they made money or not during that particular year. And occurrence forms are really offered to, you know, large hospital groups, um, physician practice groups. We don't see it at all in the med spa arena. There's actually one product out there for medical protective uh, that is on an occurrence form. They don't give it to everybody, but they're just one company out there doing it. So uh, the bottom line on that question is they just don't offer it to us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what is this chart that we're looking at? What this is, is what I just mentioned before, how claims made pricing works. It follows the risk progression. And if you I think see. of it this way, you're starting a med spa, right? You don't have any patients yet. Mm -hmm. Okay, the first year you're gonna start seeing patients. The likelihood that you're gonna get a claim in that first year from those patients that you are seeing in the first year is very low. Mm -hmm. But then that rolls to the second year. The second year, you see more patients. You're covered for the first year and the second year. And then the third year and the fourth year, vice versa. So the balloon blows up. Mm -hmm. So they're not going to charge you a mature rate the first year. They're going to charge you a mature rate more in the fourth and fifth year when now the likelihood that claims are going to start coming in from maybe those patients that you saw in the first year or two start mm -hmm. to hit. It's what they call claims development. Mm -hmm. And that usually, the, 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 time, the, the price of the, First year claims made to the price to the mature rate usually runs about 50%. So if you pay $5,000 the first year, in the fifth year, you're gonna be paying about $10,000. Mm. But you're gonna be seeing more patients, you're gonna be having higher revenues, you're gonna have more procedures under your belt. So, and that's unique in the way that they, they do insurance right now. Mm -hmm. and, and for most products, most products it's, it's today and they don't really price it for the future the way it, it but that, that stair step, so, my, my, so in the second year, my client gets an increase and they go, well, why am I, why am I getting an increase? I'm not really changed, nothing's really changed. Well, you get an increase because of the way that the, 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 the underwriters are pricing the product. And they refer to it as a step rate. And uh, the next chart will show you pretty much how the pricing has um, evolved. Whereas when I, these are actually our own because I've been doing this since 2001, these are our own figures from our own clients. You know, we basically took the average premiums in these particular years, and that's the way it followed. We started high, and then it started to go down as in 2004, 5, 6, and 7, as more insurance companies started to come in and provide capacity. And as they come into the marketplace, they undercut the current companies so they can grab market share and you have all these companies kind of jostling for market position and that caused the prime prices to go down mm -hmm. uh, to the point where they kind of bottomed out as you see three or four years ago now they're starting to head back up again because of um, reasons that i gave earlier in the presentation about mm -hmm. claims starting to come in there's more people doing it they're trying to now build the surplus in anticipation of anticipated claims do you know and when from the date somebody gets a procedure done to the date they somebody files a suit against them is there a average timeline of when well, our yeah. lawsuits actually filed good question uh we've seen uh, things get filed the day before the statute of limitations expired <laughs> hmm. and so it's a development type process i mean the, the patient has to go to a, basically a plaintiff's attorney. The plaintiff's attorney has to agree to take the case on. Mm -hmm. uh, and then they'll go and file, you know, the, the, the suit in, in court. And it's all different in terms of how that progresses. Usually it's not within six months because within a certain time frame, either that negligence is going to 
heal itself in, in like in the case of a, of a of a laser burn the scar would heal mm -hmm. or basically what triggers it dory is if what you did causes the patient to go to yet another healthcare practitioner to fix it and they run up a big medical bill that isn't paid by their their healthcare insurance because it was an elective procedure mm -hmm. so they come to you and say you know you did something to me i had to go to dermatologist and get it fixed i ran up a seventy-five thousand dollar bill here's the bill yeah and then that they're, the only way they can get you to pay for that bill is basically to file a lawsuit mm -hmm. because they have specific damages involved. Where it gets murky is when there's not damages involved. Mm -hmm. And the bottom line is if there's not damages involved, they're really not going to get any money because they don't get money anymore for pain and suffering. You, you, you can't file a lawsuit because someone was you know, uncomfortable or you know, they have to have solid damages to be able to prove that. Mm -hmm. Interesting. There was a question. Um, uh, from Chris, does the current policy include tail coverage automatically? Your policy will have tail, um, the, the tail provision on it, um, and it will give you the option of buying the tail at a certain amount of time, like you could buy one, two, or three years. I see. So they, they, they have to offer you tail by law. Okay. Uh, and it will be outlined in your cancellation section of your policy. Like when your policy is canceled, well, then they'll say you're, you have the option of buy extended reporting period. Um, th there's really no policies out there that will have the, the tail built in. Mm -hmm. Does the price of the policy vary if it's a nurse practitioner that's opening a medispa versus a physician or a nurse? Or does that vary or no? No, it really comes down to the procedures that are being done. Okay. Uh, that's a good question because, you know, do you think there would be a different pricing for a physician doing Botox versus nurse mm -hmm. practitioner doing Botox versus a nurse doing Botox? Right. But really, it's not. It really comes down to that level of training because all three of them can work a needle. Right. So right. It, it's only... They have, to show, they have to show their certification to get the insurance? Either they have to show it or they'll be required to have it in order for a claim to be paid. So, you know, it just comes down to the fact. I that mean, to get the insurance. Correct. To qualify for the insurance. Some companies will want to see the actual certificates and some will say, we don't want to see them. We're going to assume you have it. And okay. if a claim comes in, we're going to want to see it in order to get the claim paid. Okay. So you got to kind of, you know, your agent, that, that, that's part of my job is to kind of, you know, navigate you through these types of things. Right. Which leads us to the next slide, which is, you know, key things that you kind of need to know. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, of course, it's very technical in terms of, um, you know, uh, all the big that's words right. in the insurance policies. But the main things you need to know are the claims made policy, which is like I just gave you a definition on which and that is going to tie to a retroactive date the retroactive date is the date that you started the insurance that the insurance is going to go back to mm -hmm. so when you get a policy with a retroactive date prior to the date you bought it you're going to get insurance going back but then you're also going to get insurance going forward as well mm -hmm. and uh, there's really two types of main types of insurance in the insurance world one is what they call admitted and the other one is what they call surplus lines. Admitted means that the company has gone to the state because state insurance is regulated by the state. I think most people know that. And the, the insurance company has gone to the state and says, we want to do business in your state. Here's our policy form. Here's all our rates for all our classes. And the state goes ahead and approves that. And then th with, with the, um, the notion going forward that they can't change. Yeah. If you're going to charge someone or a physician, $5,623 for doing these things, you have to charge each one of them $5,623. Surplus line insurance means the state is going to allow companies from outside that state to do business within their state, mainly to do the things that the insurance companies that are admitted within their state can't do. And so not every one that, for instance, in um, uh, New York, there might only be a couple of companies that are doing uh, laser hair removal, let's say. So the state insurance department will allow companies from outside the state to come in to compete, to add capacity so that the, no one in a particular state can't get insurance. 
and they call it surplus lines companies. And they're under a completely different um, guidelines from the state in terms of what they have to submit. And they can be flexible in their form and their rate and change it from year to year. So it really resets after a year. All of a sudden my premium went up by $3,000 that I don't know why. Yeah. Well, that's because the company, you know, needs to be able to, to get the money in quicker and not have to go to the state for the permission to raise your premium. They're allowed to do that. And a lot of people don't understand that, that there's well, those two types of companies. So I have a question about the location of where you can buy it from. So if I'm living in Florida and I'm buying insurance from you from Chicago, is that something that's doable? You can sell people anywhere? As long as that particular company um, can do business in that state. Hmm. And the reason why they wouldn't do business in the state is that they just don't, maybe they don't want to, you know, do um, that particular type of business in that state. They chose, chose not to. Uh, but we, the, the bottom line is they have to be able to be a, a, a approved, what they call an approved surplus lines carrier mm -hmm. in that particular state. And most of them are. Yeah. Okay. So any other points you want to make here? We're almost at the hour. Okay. Yeah. Just a couple other things here. Um, on the, on the, on the, uh, um, the definition side, um, and I'll, these key definitions are 90% of what you really need to know from a, a, def, a, a key term standpoint. And these are the most common terms that you're going to see when you get presented with an insurance quote. You know, it's going to say surplus lines company. You're going to want, you got a definition that it's going to say right on the top of your uh, proposal. This is a claims made policy. So now you can refer to this definition. You're going to see a retroactive date. You're going to know what that is. Carrier is, is just a synonymous word for the insurance company. And then the, 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 the incident reporting is important because a company will allow you to report an incident and not at, uh, when you think you're going to get sued, if somebody threatens to sue you or if they want to see you, the, the documents of the medical records from the case or an attorney calls you, you can report that now as a claim. So if it turns into a lawsuit down the road, it reverts back to that original date you reported it. As opposed to some companies just wait until you get a lawsuit. Hmm. Even though you know it might be coming, they're just going to wait because that's when they actually bring it, right? Up until that point, the insurance company doesn't have to do anything to defend you. But once they you get a lawsuit, then boom, that triggers their duty to defend you, which is their part of the contract. Your part of the contract is to tell them all you're doing, pay the premium, be up front with them. But their part of the contract is once you get sued, then they, they respond. Mm -hmm. That's what duty to defend means when you see that. Extended reporting provision is the tail that I talked about. Step rate is the that claims made rate that I referred to. And so these terms here are really the 90% of the key terms that you need to know when you're buying insurance. Mm -hmm. So I have a couple of questions here. One sure. is uh, from June again. If I buy a laser machine and the company sending trainer for training, is it considered enough training for the procedure? If not, what certificate is accepted for laser treatment? Uh, good question. Uh, uh, the, 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 what's acceptable would be a manufacturer, you know, that, that happens a lot where the manufacturer comes out and trains you and that they give you something to reflect that, right? In the form of a certificate. They do. That's, that's the kind of training that we're referring to. Or you go out to, you know, a third party, um, where we see a lot like particularly in stem cells. Um, certified is a loose term. Uh, sort of, well, anybody can certify you. Right. Right. <laughs> okay. Just, yeah. I think you need to sharpen up your skills and make sure that you know what you're doing and your team is really trained. You can always go to other companies too, not just the laser company. You can always go and like to the Empire Medical Training or other companies that train specifically on treatments, on lasers, and learn even more. So that's always helpful. The other question um, she's also asking is, how can I know which company is allowed doing business in certain states? Oh, yeah, that's a great question. Uh, well, if you're inclined, you, you can go on the state's website, the state insurance department. Every state insurance department has a website, and they will actually give you a list of approved carriers in that state. Mm -hmm. Some of them have hundreds of them. 
and you can just go in there and type in the name of the company and it'll come up in their search. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. These are all great questions, by the way. Yeah, we have smart audience. So the only thing I wanted to do in this last is to summarize everything here. And, you know, if you're going to take away from this presentation, these are the main points, you know, solid training, solid consent, get a, a broad policy that fits what you do. Um, you know, try to develop a track record with a company because that, that holds a lot of weight when you have a claim. Um, use an independent agent to kind of knows what they're doing. Uh, uh, they're, a lot of agents only see two or three med spas, so they, they, they got to know what the terms are and they, they, they have to deal with a wholesaler. Um, and really, the, the bottom line is, is just get the best mix of price and coverage. You know, if, if it's cheap, then there's a reason why it's cheap. All the pricing usually follows a bell-shaped curve, right? There's expensive, there's cheap, but most of them kind of fall in the middle. And that's really where you kind of like where you want to be. Uh, so that's really it in a nutshell. In summary, uh, Sorry. We, we can present now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what I wanted to do actually is because a lot of these questions also that Ed was um, answering for you are some things that you can um, reach out to him and actually uh, get him to answer them for you. <clears throat> I wanted to give you his information. So you can reach him at 773-293-6185 or ed at wmpg.insure. So you can reach out to him and ask him any questions. But I wanted to go back here for a minute because I'd like to, those of you who have been part of our community but you have not had a success planning session, I would like to invite you to go to the homepage. You're gonna see this icon here and you'll be able to actually fill out a form and then one of our experts will be able to get on the phone with you or on a Zoom webinar like this and be able to help you with your business solutions or tell you at least where to go get the answers. So as I was mentioning earlier, we have quite a few events coming up, so I would like to have you come and join some of them so we can help you definitely succeed more. We'd love to hear your uh, feedback about this event. We are going to post it on our free webinar page. So if you want to go back and watch it or have other team members or other friends of yours watch it, they can always go and view it. And again, here's Ed's information. And I think we answered all the questions that came in. I'm sure I'll get some more, but I'll be able to send them to you, Ed, so that way you can actually answer them. Thanks, Tori. You're welcome. Thank you for taking the time and for uh, being with us. The information was great, and I'm so glad that you were able to join us. It was a pleasure having you. Thank Thanks you, again, everyone. Ed. Thank Have you. Have a great rest of your day. Bye, everyone. Until next time, stay inspired. Bye now. Thank you. Bye, Ed. Bye.